Welcome to this podcast. On the afternoon of Friday the 5th of April 1985, Glasgow lawyer William McCray left his flat destined for his weekend cottage at Ardell near Dorney in Rochelle, an area McCray deemed to be his ancestral home. These things mattered to Willie. He was aided in his departure by a local police officer who knew McCray. PC Donald Morrison spoke briefly with him. He seemed in good form. PC Morrison noticed he had his briefcase full of documents with him. He assisted Willie to perform a three-point turn on the street in his bulky Volvo to help avoid part of the one-way system in the depths of the city and thereby speed his escape north. PC Morrison delayed a couple of cars as McCray performed the manoeuvre to the extent that one brown saloon caught his attention as it sped off in the same direction as McCray. The journey north to his idyllic cottage normally took about four hours. The vagaries of the Scottish weather could make a big difference and he would want to complete this journey before darkness fell. But Willie would never arrive at his destination. So who was Willie McCray and why was he significant? McCray was born in May 1923 in Carron in Falkirk, where his father was an electrician. Gifted scholastically, McCray would edit a local newspaper in Grangemouth at the same time as reading history at the University of Glasgow, from which he gained a first-class degree. In the Second World War, he was commissioned into the Seaforth Highlanders, but transferred to the Royal Indian Navy, in which he became a lieutenant commander and aide-de-camp to Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten the last Viceroy of India and the first Governor General of Independent India, and Prince Philip's uncle. And Willie McCray was his right-hand man. McCray supported the Indian independence movement and was a friend of Indira Gandhi. Willie moved in fairly grandiose circles at that time. After the war, McCray returned to the University of Glasgow and graduated again, this time in law. He helped author the Maritime Law of Israel and was an emeritus professor at the University of Haifa. He had a forest of 3,000 trees planted in Israel in his memory. McCray became a solicitor and an SNP activist. In both of the 1974 general elections, and again in 1979, he stood for Parliament as the SNP candidate for Ross and Cromarty. He lost on each occasion to the Conservative candidate Hamish Gray. In the latter year, he also contested the SNP leadership. Whilst Willie was undoubtedly very intelligent, he may have lacked the people skills required for party leader. His passion for subjects he cared about could be misconstrued for being brash and outspoken. McCray was a vocal critic of the British nuclear lobby. Early in the 1980s, he was a key figure in a campaign against the plans of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority to dispose of nuclear waste in the Mulhwaka area of the Galloway Hills. Representing the SNP in a public inquiry, McCray asked difficult questions of the authority and famously declared at one meeting that nuclear waste should be stored where Guy Fawkes put his gunpowder. The authority's plans were rejected and McCray was credited with single-handedly preventing the area from becoming a nuclear waste dump. His reputation in the eyes of Whitehall was as a rabble-rouser. Alongside his anti-nuclear campaigning, where his next project was to be leading the fight against expansion at Dune Ray in the forthcoming 1986 inquiry into those plans, McCray had also risen to be vice-chairman of the SNP. The movement towards independence was beginning to gain real traction at this time. These issues were what occupied McCray's thoughts. It's ironic that McCray had been a part of the establishment for a number of years, to the extent that he had even worked in military intelligence for a time and it was now his biggest thrill to frustrate it. He may have been this military intelligence experience that led Willie to believe he was under surveillance by those of any forces in the months leading up to his death. He had even noted some vehicle numbers that, it would posthumously be proved, had links to the security services and Strathclyde special branch. In the days leading up to his death, Willie had claimed to some of those around him that he had something in his possession that, and I quote, they can't wriggle out of, end quote. What was that something? We don't know, but maybe someone find out. The notion that McCray could be under surveillance is not in the least fanciful, given the political situation at the time. McCray was heavily involved in what were then at least three very important issues. 
The anti-nuclear campaign, both energy and weapons, were considered vital to UK interests. North Sea oil was essentially bankrolling the ailing UK economy in the late 70s and 80s, and independent Scotland would devastate that. Of this, the big cheeses in Whitehall were well aware, even if the masses were not, thanks to government suppression of the Macaron report. Add into that the genuine fear that Scotland might go the way of Northern Ireland and descend into chaos. The establishment had a lot to lose, and the removal of the rabble rouser Macrae from these equations was not the worst thing from an establishment point of view. Macrae was a chain smoker, but he had very specific requirements, and his particular preferred smokes were not available locally. He had them shipped in from a supplier in Ireland. As such, he tended to carry in his car at least a carton of 200. As he was going away for the weekend, he would certainly have had them amongst his provisions. He was also a heavy drinker, again with a taste for a particular brand, two bottles of which he had purchased that day from his regular off-license, telling the vendor of his intention to enjoy a dram that evening by the fireside of his logside cottage. Willie had been caught driving over the legal limit twice before, and the last time only quite recently. Another incident would see him banned and possibly in prison. Willie had other worries. A few months previously, a fellow anti-nuclear campaigner, Hilda Morell, had been murdered after apparently disturbing a burglar at a cottage in Shrewsbury, for which no one had been arrested. Ms Morell, a 78-year-old noted environmentalist, had been scheduled to deliver a paper speaking out against the Sizewell B nuclear plant at their inquiry. Willie's cottage had also been burgled. Willie had attested to friends that they didn't get what they were looking for, but as his office had also previously been burgled, he had taken to carrying his most sensitive documents with him in his briefcase, as well as allegedly carrying an unlicensed .22 caliber revolver he was known to possess. So it was that Willie McRae set off on his journey north late on that Friday afternoon in April. The four-hour trip should see him get there before the evening shadows grow too long. Unfortunately, McRae's car appears to have suffered a puncture somewhere along the journey, which would have delayed him for how long is unknown. What we do know is Willie McRae was next seen at 10.30 on the following morning by two Australian tourists, Mr and Mrs Crow, who had spotted the maroon Volvo off the road as they drove towards Kyle of the Hulsh. They had initially driven past the car as there were no signs of movement, but out of concern turned around and returned to the scene. Years later, Mr Alan Crowe stated that he had initially used his binoculars to view the wreckage as he claimed the car was over a hundred yards from the road. It was only after this and seeing McRae's apparently lifeless form that he made his way down to the car. The car was facing back up the slope in the direction from which it appeared to have come. It looked as though it had rolled over several times before coming to rest, straddling a burn. Mr Crow was able to detect a faint pulse, and he made his way back up to the road whereupon the Crows were able to flag down another vehicle. It carried four people, including, as luck would have it, a doctor, Dorothy Messer, and Dundee SNP councillor David Coots, who made their way down to the crash vehicle, whilst in these pre-mobile phone days sending some of the others to summon help. As a fellow active member of the same party, Councillor Cooks quickly recognised the victim as being Willie McRae, whom he had known for several years. Dr Messer examined the unconscious patient and was able to ascertain only one injury to the right side of McRae's head, where the hair and side of his face were caked with dried blood. He was unresponsive and one of his pupils was dilated, which the doctor felt indicated a degree of brain injury. He was barely alive. He had clearly been there for some hours. At this point, it was assumed to be a straightforward road accident. It was also at this point that much of the mystery, intrigue and confusion takes over the entire incident. Conflicting interpretations of events from various parties have fanned the flames of the conspiracy theorists. Differing accounts and a ham-fisted investigation have meant the Willie McRae story just can't be laid to rest. Willie McRae was taken to Ragmore Hospital in Inverness where his head was x-rayed. Or was it? There are conflicting reports on that. There were no x-rays present when, the, when he arrived at ARI Forrester Hill in Aberdeen. The attending nurse pointed out the lack of x-rays and is quoted as saying, they just stuck a tube in him and put him back in the ambulance. 
The same nurse insisted an x-ray has been taken before she attempted to clean his wound for fear of neck or spinal damage. These x-rays revealed a bullet lodged in Willie's brain. The nurse, Catherine McGonigal, when interviewed by the National Newspaper in 2018, claimed the wound was at the back of McRae's head, not in the temple as Dr Messer had suggested. After the standard test for brain activity, Willie was found to be brain dead. Willie's next of kin and surviving family instructed the doctors to let him slip away in the early hours of Sunday 7th of April 1985. gunshot wound meant this was no ordinary road traffic accident. The gunshot wound was not discovered until 7.30pm at the earliest. On reading the official police record it states that at this point senior police officers were informed and attended at the locus. The vehicle was secured and removed to police headquarters in Verness. About 3.30am on Sunday, April the 7th, 1985, McCrae died of his injuries without regaining consciousness. From the position of the wound in the deceased's right temple, it appeared to be self-inflicted. As a result, police officers carried out a search to the locus and found the weapon. It is unclear when exactly this search to the locus occurred. As it is written in the report, it seems to have been done after the vehicle had been recovered. Given that, from the time the crews discovered McRae's crashed car at 10.30am until 7.30pm, it was thought to have been a straightforward road accident. It's not unreasonable to have removed the vehicle in that time. So officers returned to the scene the next morning and discovered this gun at 10.30am in the barn directly beneath the driver's door, where the car had been situated. How did it get there? How was it able to lie there in the barn unseen by all who assisted in removing McRae's limp frame from the car, including Alan Crow, the ambulance men, PC Crawford, the first police officer on the scene, whose hat fell off and landed in the barn only to be retrieved by David Coots? None of them saw it. None of the police officers or vehicle recovery crew reported seeing the gun supposedly lying right under the door of the car. Coots has stated that he was later shown marked photographs indicating that the gun was found some distance from the car. The official narrative would have us believe that McCrae was drunk at the wheel and crashed. Overcome with guilt over another drink driving charge and fearing prison, he shot himself with his own gun. The recoil from which threw the gun from his hand out of the broken window and into the barn. This version of events was accepted by the procurator fiscal who decreed that the matter had been fully investigated, and as it was deemed a suicide, a fatal accident inquiry was not appropriate. Though quite how he was able to arrive at that decision, given that the post-mortem report was not released until two or three days later, is a mystery. How could he possibly know the bullet in Willie's brain came from the gun found at the scene? Whilst he did not see the gun, what David Coots is on record as seeing was a pile of documents neatly stacked yards from the vehicle with a wristwatch placed on top. Along with his reservations about the gun, he also has misgivings about where the official record has the incident located, claiming it to be a mile and a half southeast of where the police record states the event took place, thus taking it from Inverness into Loch Arbor, a different legal jurisdiction. We have the differing accounts of the crash scene itself, the official story and indeed the police photographs show the car lying about 30 yards from the road. Coots places it 100 yards away from the road. This is corroborated by the completely independent Australian tourist Alan Crowe. Police records contain a statement from the Crows. Alan Crowe insists no statements were ever asked for nor given. They were not even aware McCrae had suffered a gunshot injury until contacted in Australia by a UK documentary maker years after the event. Other anomalies exist. Two different garages, one in Inverness and one in the much closer to the crash site, Fort Augustus, both claiming to have recovered the vehicle. Was the vehicle moved then replaced after the bullet wound was discovered? If this is the case, one would imagine the original recovery of the vehicle would have left telltale signs on the scene. This might explain the need for a different location for the scene of crime photographs, 
and the discrepancies between the eyewitness accounts of the crash scene and the photographs. Upon removing the car back to Inverness, its contents were inventoried. Along with the personal effects and supplies one would expect to find, a half a bottle of the famous Grouse whiskey was recovered. As I mentioned earlier, Willie was very particular. He wouldn't sully his palate with a blended whiskey, and this was not the whiskey he had purchased earlier that day. The cigarettes chain smoker McCree would inevitably have had for his weekend away were absent. On the subject of things being absent, it has recently been discovered that no fingerprints were taken from the gun, no forensic examination was done either of the body or his clothes for proof that McCree had even fired a gun that day. And the gun is now absent from the case files, along with several important documents, including police statements pertaining to the case, with no record of when they were removed, or by whom, or what became of them. So what are we to make of the events of that weekend 36 years ago? Was Willie McRae the subject of a special branch surveillance? Well, the fact he had noted the registrations of cars that were later independently checked and were shown to have links to the security services and special branch suggests he probably was. But was he deemed such a threat to the establishment that it would be necessary to eliminate him? What did McRae have? Information regarding illegal nuclear activities, perhaps? Maybe Hilda Morell had stumbled on the same information which had cost her her life. Well, in 2005 we got an answer to that, when Andrew George, who had been a 17-year-old tailorway at the time, was convicted in a cold case solved through DNA advances, and would have no connection to anything related to Willie's situation. Or had McCray gotten into something else, something deeper, darker, something that would rock the establishment to its core? A report in the Sunday Express of 30th of November 2014 claimed McCray had a dossier in his possession relating to an alleged paedophile ring operating dubbed the Untouchables and involving cabinet ministers and senior officials on both sides of the border. Now how he might have come to know of this group is unclear, but there has been speculation it may have been as a result of his connections to Lord Mountbatten, who, it was something of an open secret, had predilections for young boys as a young naval officer in Singapore, regularly frequenting male brothels when he was stationed there. Willie had kept the secret for all these years. Perhaps Mountbatten's name was mentioned in this dossier. Maybe Willie felt his loyalty to protect Mountbatten's name ended when he was killed by the IRA in 1979 and was set to uncover the secrets of a man who had become in later life guide and mentor to the Prince of Wales. Willie's death certainly fits the timeline regarding sex abuse allegations from the early 80s, involving politicians and massive plea cover-ups. It was also closely followed by MP Geoffrey Dickens' claims of having his home burgled and receiving death threats after he brought this alleged dossier up in Parliament. It's a known fact that the security services and police did cover up the child sex abuse crimes of Cyril Smith. Years later, the scandal surrounding Jimmy Savile's sordid activity shone a light on the subject like never before. Maybe even today more information will come to light about the untimely death of Willie McRae and we will have the true story. At the very least, what we have appears to be a bungled police operation with plentiful testimony that suggests that they have manipulated evidence to cover that fact up. Or we have an uninvestigated murder perpetrated by person or persons unknown and staged to look like a suicide. Or maybe we already have the true story that just doesn't ring true because even the most basic facts of the case have question marks hanging over them. Perhaps Willie did just get drunk, crash his car, clamber out of the wrecked vehicle and in the dark pile up a few papers, taking time to secrete somewhere the sensitive documents that he had felt were important enough that he needed to carry a gun to protect, climb back into his car and in a fit of remorse, shoot himself in the head and then, brain dead as he was, throw the gun out the window. Yeah, there's nothing to see here, folks. Move along. All information contained and referred to in this podcast comes from resources free and publicly available in press archives or the internet. Background effects courtesy of zapsplat.com Title and end music courtesy of Steve Plows at deadloud.co.uk.